introduce yourself and your involvement with WRDA. My name is Margaret Ward and I was the director of WRDA from 2008 to 2013. Thank you. Um, tell us a bit about yourself and your journey as a feminist. I started, I became a feminist I think um, as a consequence of the civil rights movement which also dovetailed with the early years of the women's liberation movement in Britain. It was a bit later to come over here but I had been part of people's democracy and civil rights and then I went to Queen's and didn't stay active in politics because the trouble started and you know it was difficult to know where you fitted in in a very polarised very difficult situation but I became more and more interested in feminism and meeting other women who were interested and so we set up the uh, Women's Liberation Society in Queen's in 1973-1974 um, um, and that evolved then. Um, we then wanted to be outside of Queen's and became more and more specific about the kind of feminists that we were and we were very much influenced by socialist feminism and women like Sheila Robotham for me personally as somebody interested in women and, and history. So. In 1975, myself and a few others set up the Socialist Women's Group, uh, which was a very serious body. We developed a manifesto and we had meetings mainly with left-wing groups to find out what programmes they had for women or what their analysis was of women's oppression. Um, and then it evolved from there, um, isolating what were key issues, trying to... Um, trying to bring feminism and women's issues into all sorts of different arenas that had never thought about them. And that brought up a whole lot of questions about our views on imperialism, on the British presence in Ireland, which, as you can imagine, was difficult for quite a few people. Um, some felt we were far too insular as a group and too focused on that and we wanted to be wider we wanted to attract more women so finally there was a kind of split within the socialist women's group that some women went on to form women against imperialism and they worked very closely with the armar women's prisoner solidarity campaign uh, with local women in um, communities in west belfast and we formed the belfast women's collective which then it's much more um, focused on key issues like reproductive rights, um, violence against women, childcare, a whole host of issues that really depended on what women wanted to take up. Thank you. Um, that's really interesting what you were talking about there. I think those kind of tensions that you were talking about that, that um, happened in the social women's group and led to a kind of split do you think they're, they're still present in the modern feminist movement here or do you think the, the ending of the Troubles has largely resolved that? I think things have, have moved considerably. When, when we were talking about um, the British presence and imperialism, I think we, one of the things that we, we weren't focused on, I think, were the totality of women's experiences here and women in unionist communities, um, they were very much kind of isolated, I would say, from the women's movement, or that we were isolated from them, but there were very few points of reference. And I think partly because uh, feminism was seen as kind of, not synonymous with republicanism, but it was seen as something that was going against the status quo, and that did make unionist women wary of forming alliances and um, I became uh, the project officer for Belfast City Council later on in the um, mid-1980s and it was through that that I started meeting women from different communities and seeing at that stage through things like the Women's Education Project which is the forerunner of WRDA um, the kind of work that was being done in different communities that wouldn't be called feminism, but it was certainly raising the consciousness of women and working with them on 
different education projects, for example. Um, and so suddenly finding the commonality of experiences for women, working class women in different communities started, I think, building a different layer of understanding of feminism. And I think I think took some of the polarization out of it when people started to see what they had in common. Why do you think feminism is still a dirty word to some people? Well, to me, I, I don't understand why people can't simply just say that, that they are feminists. Um, I know that the late Joyce McCartan, who was very active in the Lower Roma Road, always called herself a family feminist. And I think what she thought was that we as feminists, because well, when I, obviously when I was starting out, I was young, I didn't have children, etc. I think they thought that we were in some way in opposition to women who were, whose primary role was within the home, working within the home, and that we wanted everyone to, you know, be going out, getting a job, being independent, not necessarily having children, or if we did, or if they did, shoving them out to childcare kind of 24 hours a day kind of thing there was the stereotype of what a feminist was that I think made older women in particular or women within the home feel well I, I, I'm not a feminist I, I'm not a professional career woman or something like that that was in my time and I understand that a lot more once I had children myself that that women you know there, were, there, there was the famous cartoon you know um, I'm only a housewife and we spent so long trying to convince women that, you know, housewife was important work and you were never only just that anyway. And that that was the kind of thing that went through and it probably still goes through. Um, there was also a, a, a very prominent campaign, not so much here, but in Britain, um, the Wages for Housework campaign was very active in the 80s. Um, and Selma James, um, who, who headed it up in, in, uh, in Britain, or she was an American woman, um, was, they were kind of using Marxist analysis to show that women's labour within the home was the basis of capitalist society, and therefore they should be paid for that work. And we had huge debates about that, whether that would actually make sure that women never were able to leave the home if they were getting paid for housework etc now i think that we still have those kind of things but we call them different things you know we call we talk about a universal income and what thing what what people are um entitled to and it, and, it, and it gets away from those gender stereotypes that people deserve a living wage or they deserve um the form of support to the state that they can have a, a life dignity and I think that was part of the the wages for housework campaign but it became quite a divisive issue within feminism at the time but I think you know the debates have evolved so much since then. During my research for this interview I got the impression I don't know if you'll um, necessarily agree with this but I got the impression that your work as a feminist academic has been about writing women back into the narrative of Irish history and making women's history visible. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a bit about, compared to 1983 when um, WRDA's um, predecessor got going, what progress do you feel has been made in increasing women's visibility in the historical record and in, in, in public life? I've never put the two dates together, but you know, in 1983, my first book, Unmanageable Revolutionaries, was first uh, published. So that was about women, uncovering women's role in nationalism in Ireland, but it went from 1880 up to um, the 1980s, the early 80s, and I tried to convey some of the, the debates within feminism in my concluding chapter. And, and that was an important book and, and um, has been a foundation for a lot of research that's come about since um, and I've gone on to do a lot more work in terms of women and suffrage etc so I think now it's not perfect at all but there are you know women studying history when I when I when I was a student at Queen's I was never 
lectured to by an academic either as an undergraduate or a postgraduate. There were no women in the department. It was very male and when I wanted to do the work, the research, they said that um, I couldn't. It took me a year to convince the professors that, that this was viable. Their argument was women hadn't done anything. If they had done something, it would have been written about by now. So I actually had to convince them to let me do the work. So that's a huge step change now that when um, the Irish government's just had, we've just had a kind of 10 year decade of centenaries, women were written into that, not, not, not because the Irish government is particularly understanding of women in history, but there were enough academics out there to insist that in all these key times, women have also played a part. So I think there has been a big change in, in the historical record. I noticed that in our 2010 annual report, you commented on the underrepresentation of women in public and political life in Northern Ireland. But we're almost 15 years later and that is still largely the reality. Why do you think this remains such an intransigent problem, especially mm. women um, going into politics? Well, if you think of public life and then political life, I think in public life things has cha have changed quite a lot because I was thinking of all the, the big organisations that exist in terms of public sector organisations, um, Human Rights Commission or the Equality Commission or the Victims Commissioner, the Police Ombudsman, the Arts Council, all of those have been headed by women or are headed by women. So women, I think, in public life have made big strides, have always been these great women, competent and forward looking women out there and, and they have broken through a glass ceiling without a doubt. It used to be, um, you know, that the, the uh, phrase was the, the glass cliff, that women only got appointed to an organisation if it was, you know, in, in trouble and then they could take the blame for it as it everything disintegrated but it's not the case now women have broken at glass ceiling and they're there in public life they're not there enough in i think in in lower down positions there's not rep, rep, sufficient representation or any representation i'd say of you know, working class women women with disabilities women of color you know we're way behind that although i think that in terms of recruitment into positions there's more of an effort been made now. I think political life is a different matter. Um, it used to be, I mean, when the troubles were on, it was just too dangerous. Women didn't want to put themselves out there and put themselves at risk. Um, and I think we're still in a post-conflict society where it's where it is difficult. But I think that um, the challenge of the women's coalition was really significant to political parties and you could see it wasn't simply that there was a women's party out there saying women have deserve a seat at the table and women are going to ensure that they're going to be at the table during negotiations what when they were formed they it's like they took a lid off all the misogyny and hatred of women when you saw how during the peace forum unionist parties in particular treated them, you know, go home and breed for Ulster, mooing at them, all of that, it was absolutely horrendous. And so much of that has been caught on camera. Uh, you know, it really exposed something. And I think that parties, they might not have changed that much internally, but they certainly know that they need to put a better face on it. But you also saw that when coalition candidates were standing for election, political parties started putting women up against them and looking for more women candidates because you know there are you know all of the obstacles to women well the first is getting selected and 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 breaking through so many political parties are happy to have them it's you know the the tea makers or whatever so all the you know the the child care is a big issue you know because so many political meetings are in the evening or at tea time council meetings tend to be, you know, that early evening time. So all of the research that's been done on childcare, confidence, cash, the five C's, are, are the things that have militated against women being politically active. 
and, and there's still obstacles. Um, and particularly, I would say, the childcare one. And how can we make political life more woman friendly or more family friendly that enable women to take uh, to take that role? Uh, you know, because you, you want to encourage young women to come in, young women have children, so you have the position then that there's no maternity leave, you know, they bring in their children in. What happens then, you know, in the South, um, Helen McEntee, a minister who's just had her second child, getting sanctioned for bringing a her baby into the chamber. Uh, in, in Westminster, Stella Creasy, the same, you know, board of breastfeeding, baby into the chamber. There is no creche or anything like that. The Women's Coalition, when they were um, first in the assembly, campaigned for a creche on site and that, that never happened. There was such resistance to that. Um, something like that would make, is an easy thing to do and it would make life so much easier for women. As feminists living in a society still emerging from conflict, uh, during your time at WRDA, um, how did WRDA contribute to making the role of women and the experiences of women during the Troubles visible in the discourses around the conflict's legacy? Well, um, we did that in various ways. One of the things that we did was we had a project on women talking about the Troubles, um, which went out and it had residentials that worked with women uh, brought women together from very different backgrounds, um, talking about their experiences, their experiences growing up, um, their experiences with their parents, um, with society generally, and put that together. And I, th I thought it was really, um, when I was putting, assembling it all, how, how moving it was to, you know, one woman I can remember, um, you know, saying my daddy loved Ireland more than me, um, because he was in prison for so long and, you know, women, you, you, you suddenly realise the, the intergenerational impact of all of that. And these, these were looking back on their early years and, and still with, with huge amount of pain and hurt because they didn't understand what was going on or, or why their father in this case wasn't with them. Um, they could see, you know, the difficulties their mothers went through or whatever, or what it was like um, just going to school or being scared, um, you know, being stopped or having strange men in the countryside. And, 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 and the urban and rural differences and all of that were, was very interesting as well. And when we got it um, launched, um, Jeffrey Donaldson actually was the one who launched it. and. Um, you know, what he said at the time was, uh, it's a very valuable piece of social history. And I think he was, you know, absolutely right about that. And it's, I think it's those sort of things that, you know, that are important not to just get lost or just get filed as a report, but, but, but one can learn from them or, or have that learning in, in other places as well. But it, it's important to see what our society has gone through and why we have, you know, it explains so much in terms of mental health issues, dependency on prescription drugs and all sorts of things, you know, can stem from those experiences that WRDA, I think, really documented very well in, in that report. Can you tell us a bit about the Hannah's House project and your involvement in, in that? Well, Hannah Shee Skeffington was uh, an Irish suffragette, uh, our, our best known suffragette, and I've written a biography of her. Um, she went to jail several times for her fight for suffrage. She was based in Dublin, but had lots of links in the north. In fact, sp spoke in Ormo Park one year as well and got heckled for her Dublin accent. Um, but I knew her granddaughter, Michelin, and... Um, Hannah's son, Owen, um, had developed TB and when he returned from a sanitarium, they got a house that at that time was just outside Dublin. It's actually in Terra Neur. It's not, it's not outside Dublin now, but it was in a market garden area. And so they still had a lovely garden and they had this house, not a grand house by any manner of means. Um, and Michelin was then living in it. 
and she was very keen that it could form a basis for women from all over Ireland to come together and talk about issues and strategize and develop campaigns and a, a group of people developed around that um, and Joanna McMinn was actually living in the house at the time as well she was renting it for a while as she had taken up a post as director of the National Women's Council of Ireland um, Joanna and my personal and uh, pr professional lives seem to you know box and cox a lot so anyway they then I, I became involved at first it was a Dublin based thing so we started having a campaign about it was that initial Hannah's house but when there was a feasibility study done it was obvious that it just wasn't suitable as a residential centre and it couldn't be transformed without losing its character so we were in a position of wanting a Hannah's house but the actual physical Hannah's house wasn't suitable so we decided on a virtual Hannah's house and uh, Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust supported us very generously and we had a worker and we organised over a number of years a series of events all around Ireland on different themes um, that were either for example in Derry I think we were talking about the kind of the recent past and, and, and the troubles but as we went around different places in Galway I think we were talking much more on that was on violence against women uh, in Cork I think we were talking about new migrant communities and how Ireland was changing so um, we would bring women from all the different communities together and have those kind of discussions and it kind of developed from that it became almost international in looking at women and conflict um, and then we had a big all-Ireland um, conference in Croke Park that President Higgins opened it was one of his early uh, events as president of Ireland and we had um, uh, people like um, Judith Gillespie from the PSNI talking about the role of women in policing and so we had women who were in, in prominent public roles talking talking about and how you know the whole thing was about transformation how we could understand what was happening and try and transform things but um, it wasn't that it ran out of steam. I think it had got to a stage where what what could you do next to bring all of this together? Um, and I think that what it did bring was the National Women's Council of Ireland and WRDA closer together as two women's organisations on the island of Ireland who'd been, you know, hadn't worked together. I mean, they had in the past, but hadn't worked together for a long time and trying to see, you know, what women had in common and how we could work together and so we did have another peace funded project together um, but Hannah's house then you know we had a, a really good web presence lots of publications but then in the end we didn't have the money to keep that going and, and, and it's terrible that the the whole website which was a fantastic resource doesn't exist now and I think that's often the way of funded projects you know you eventually kind of run out of money people move on you know the core organizing committee we all were moving on to different things so that was the end then of the Hannah's House project but it was while well, it lasted I thought it was great. In 2011 WRDA alongside Women's Tech developed a Women's History Tour of Belfast. Can you talk about how this project came about and what impact it had on increasing the visibility of women's impact on Belfast? This was um, celebrating Belfast women and I just had this idea that I had a lot of knowledge about Belfast women um, that wasn't out there, that I could put out there so that everyone would know more about the contribution women in Belfast had made to the history of Belfast and to women's campaigns. Um, and because, you know, tourism was starting to really happen in Belfast and the different tours but what about a woman's tour um, and then because of WRDA's whole ethos which is you know it's not just a top it's not 
we'll try not to be top down but bottom up what about training women as tour guides and giving them the information and passing it on to them so that was a good mix between WRDA and my expertise so I undertook to write a booklet celebrating Belfast women and W and women's tech then undertook the training of women who wanted to be tour guides and so they got a an NVQ qualification from that and um, we also then as a third leg of that um, had a series of lectures in the Ulster Hall lunchtime lectures um, so it was a really nice gathering that people could come in at lunchtime have a lecture on May, May Blood gave one and her life you know working in the factory and, and, and how her life developed after that. She ended up in the, the House of Lords. I talked about the suffrage movement. Myrtle Hill talked about women and history, more generally the contribution women had made in Belfast. And so we had a whole series of lectures. We had lovely sandwiches and tea and coffee and people could just get together beforehand and chat and listen to the lecture. So it was really, really good. And, and, and the woman who, um, so the pamphlet was produced and I think it's a, a great resource. Um, is it of its time? I know even more than I knew then, but you know, it, it does give you a lot of North, South, East and West Belfast. And the women who, who undertook the um, training, they got a lot individually in terms of their own personal knowledge of history and also how to conduct uh, a tour guide and how to speak in public, um, all sorts of transferable skills. And a lot of them then went on not to become tour guides themselves, but they got jobs. The Titanic building was just opening. Several of them got jobs in that. So that was a great result as well. Um, a lot of them, you know, found that it was a transformative personal experience. And one woman, um, Lorraine, Mills went on to develop the Millie tour and she's just you know I, I follow her on Facebook and she does general tours as well but she seems to be making a, you know good living as, as a tour guide and seems to be really busy and I'm just delighted that that happened. During your time then as director in 2011 WRDA became active on Facebook and then Twitter and um, we've um, we've continued to expand our engagement via social media in the years since adding Instagram. Um, what has the effect of social media been on the visibility of the feminist movement and what impact has this had on feminism um, here and around the world? Yeah, when we started, I mean, I was always very keen that we had a good website and we revamped our website a lot um, to make sure that we had it all our publications, newsletters, everything was out there. Um, and of course, WRDA had all, already hosted Women's Link for a long time, which is a really great way of linking up all the different women's groups all over the place and individuals. I still would get the Women's Link um, messages. So social media has always been important for the women's movement. I mean, there was a time when we had to have all sorts of um, well, I can see now with the website, you have to log in and register and various things. It's not always a safe place for women out there in, um, in terms of the kind of misogyny one and trolling and that, which has certainly developed. But when we, we started um, one of the posts I'm, I'm, I'm most pleased about was the women's sector lobbyists that we got. And you know, can talk about that in more detail. But one of the things that she did was really to develop the social media site as a communication tool and that's I think when we started Twitter and um, all of that so, I mean those were in the early days and obviously it's developed so I, I'm a great Twitter user and I, I, I in my own life finding out um, about conferences and events is just I don't think I'd hear about half the things that I would go to or subscribe to if it wasn't for Twitter. But I can see also if you take if you're looking at reproductive rights, abortion campaigns, you know, what women are doing in places like Malta, for example, or what's happening in other places, you can find that out. Um, 
through that kind of women's network and, 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 and who tweets. So I think it's a really important tool, I feel, for enhancing the visibility of women and campaigns and just letting people know what's out there. Because if you're not in an organisation and hearing all of that, you're really dependent on being able to log in and find out what, what's happening. So I think it's a great communication tool. Yes, thank you. And um, you mentioned there the Women's Centre Lobbyist post, and um, we still have a Women's Centre Lobbyist today. In fact, that post has um, expanded, mm -hmm. and we now also have a lobbyist's assistant. I was wondering if, if you could talk um, a bit about the origin of that post and how it developed during your time. When I was um, director, I was very active in um, the group that met with civil servants to develop the gender equality strategy. Um, we'd meet politicians or we'd meet civil servants on various things. Um, we would collect all this evidence on women's needs, etc. But, you know, the gap was how do you, how do you make that information important enough to change policy, to change legislation. What's the link there? How are we going to make politicians understand or speak up? Because one of the things was that the assembly was very new. Politicians had very little experience. Um, most of them wouldn't have had a kind of policy background. So I felt there was a real way in there if you had somebody who could inform them so that's why i thought a women's sector lobbyist that wouldn't just be it wasn't lobbying this is what some people couldn't understand it wasn't lobbying for wrda it was lobbying for the issues that affected all women and you know it took some convincing i think for organizations to see that wrda wasn't just putting in a bid for itself but it took a while before you could see that so lynn carvel was our first lobbyist and who did a fantastic job in first of all getting to know politicians and developing a relationship with them. Um, then we we had different ways of, of, of communicating all of this. We had a few we had policy seminars. They, were, they weren't called that, but what we would have is we would have experts, we would have politicians and we would have kind of policy practitioners all talking about an issue, say, uh, inf um, issues affecting older women. So you could have the Older Women's Network, an academic who was specialising in that kind of area, etc. And, and hoping that that kind of information could then get translated back into debates and storment, for example. Um, we also, uh, Lynn started a, a lobbying newsletter uh, bringing up issues so that we, she would be seeing what was coming up on the political agenda, what were the key issues, and then what did we want as the women's sector to have? And, you know, we started seeing when the debates went on that some of them were just actually just reading from those briefing news sheets. So I thought it was a really great way um, of encouraging and supporting politicians to take up issues and giving them enough information that they felt confident in doing that. Um, obviously that became difficult in terms of when the assembly wasn't in existence, but committees were still there. Um, there were other campaigns we got involved in, like um, when austerity really hit the empty purses protest and, um, and then linking up with Reclaim the Agenda. And so I think the, the women's policy role, I think it's, it's pretty unique and Roundtree as a funder have always been incredibly supportive of it um, and, and wanted to continue the funding. They could see the, um, the real significance of having that link there between politicians, policy and women. They, they've, they've been fantastic women in, in those positions, yes, and I, I continue to follow them and everyone has their own particular strengths that, and, and things that they can bring to that role and, and I mean COVID was such a challenging time you know how did you work how did you operate how did you communicate and people were having to be very creative in how they could 
you know, work from home, be isolated, but put information together, remaining in touch and trying to get the message across. And that feminist recovery plan was a brilliant piece of work. Thank you, yes. Um, we maybe have touched on this slightly, but um, what are you most proud of from your time at WRRDA? And what do you feel is the organisation's greatest achievement? Uh, WRDA has been a, a great organisation, had great foundations when I came in. The one thing I thought it didn't have as much, it, it had this fantastic foundation of working with women in the community. The community facilitated programme, fantastic, both in terms of the health information it imparted, but also the training that it gave to women and the qualification they got. So all of that was great and, and you know, and that was running smoothly. It, it didn't need any input particularly from me. What I felt that it lacked was um, greater visibility generally as an organisation, an organisation that it was articulating women's interests and taking part and, you know, critiquing what was out there. And so I think that my role, and I, I, I think I did achieve that, was to bring up WRDA is that, that authoritative voice for women, not the only voice out there, but a, an authoritative voice that um, the media could come to, um, politicians could have faith in policy makers, that it could go out to um, different policy fora and, 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 you know, and hold its own and, and put forward um, really strong um, issues. And, and, and well argued. How do you feel then that the feminist movement in Northern Ireland has changed over the last 40 years? Um, I think the biggest change, I left Northern Ireland in 1986 and didn't come back till 1999 and when I left WRDA, well the Women's Education Project had jo Joanna McMinn as a paid worker you start, you'd had downtown women's centre with, I think, a, a part-time worker. Um, the Falls Women's Centre, I think, had just about started. They were all kind of on-the-ground initiatives by feminists who'd been acting on the ground. Um, the Women's Education Project was started off by women who'd worked in women's studies, the WEA, etc. But most of it was voluntary labour and uh, very shoestring, you know, one room kind of things. And when I came back, because of the peace money and everything else, there was these, all these organisations, women's centres, very professionalised. And we, talk, we didn't talk about the women's movement anymore. We talked about the women's sector. Um, so, you know, that has good and bad points. You know, a lot of it was, you know, a lot of time is spent chasing the money, worrying about being compromised, you know, will your funder let you do things? How do you negotiate all of that if governments are giving you money? Um, things that we never used to have to worry about before. So, that, you know, because when it came to controversial issues, um, that was a consideration. So negotiating, you know, where the boundaries were. So I found all of that quite a... Um, quite difficult to take because over in England where I was everything was still on that voluntary um, capacity little organisations um, it wasn't like here I mean Northern Ireland I don't think realises in some senses just how much the peace funding and, and the European funding has, has made this huge difference and created um a sector that you know I, I don't see its equivalent in other places um, and, it, and it's maintained I mean it's been hard you know the, the funding goes up and down and organizations have to have to deal with that but um, it's an achievement it's a huge achievement because it was women lobbying for that and lobbying against the odds for it um, but it's also important to be campaigning and unafraid to speak out, regardless of whether that offends, you know. So it's 
I guess, treading that line as well. Yes, um, I hadn't actually realised that um, there wasn't quite the same um, sort of um, professionalised sector across the water. So that's a very interesting difference that we have here mm -hmm. then. Um, I suppose there always is, you know, for every organisation, there's always that fear of mission drift and kind of being led by the funding. Um, but I, I think certainly it's um, something which we have managed to avoid. Um, Although, you know, I'm sure that's not true for every organisation, but it it is always a concern. I mean, what do you think was lost in that transition from movement to sector? Um, in particular, do you think that um, space is still held as well um, by and for working class women? Well, I think that... Um... You know, how, how much um, can, say, women's centres empower the women that they use as then to become involved? You know, not simply as recipients of whatever it is, but, but, but much more, you know, taking control, saying what they want, and maybe then taking on paid roles as well, you know, because it should be about the empowerment of women and you know, not simply having them as kind of just users and consumers all the time. Um, so I think that that's an interesting, you know, different organ different centres of different models. So you can't really just say there's one, but I think that that's one, you know, you don't want to be in some sort of social work kinds of role and there can be, there can be a, bit, a bit of a difficulty there. You know, how do you actually impart feminist ideas and you're not just doing um, education and tea and biscuits, you know, because that was the other tension I can remember when, when women, some women's education groups first started and it was all about, you know, knitting and various things. And, you know, and I was impatient that there wasn't something a bit more challenging. It was always about, but we have to start here. But, you know, the starting here seems to go on, can go on forever and you never get anywhere else so um, I, th I think there's that question to be asked you know what are we doing what are we achieving and how much have we changed women's lives but I mean the challenges here I, I can't um, I can't downplay because there are challenges that you wouldn't get other places when the, so many of the centres are in the heart of areas that have been controlled by paramilitary groups or continue to be controlled and women have to carve out. It's so important to keep that women only space. That's, I think, the, the, the main issue, I think, now, because that's where a lot of funding pressure has been. I know from when I was WRDA director that there was some government funding certainly wanting us to change that. Um, and once, and I know from some women's centres, you know, once that would happen, you're lost. You know, and, and, and the, the women in new communities, Muslim women coming in, for example, you know, who can come into a safe woman only space that they wouldn't be able to do if it wasn't that. There are so many ramifications to being women only and how important it is and how important to keep that. Yes, thank you. I think um, we have a document that was written by another women's sector lobbyist and it's called Why Women Only. Mm. Um, and we will link that in the video description for anybody who wants to find out more about about that. I wrote a briefing paper for government to put for DSD at the time on why women only to sort of say why it was important. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I think um, there's always is that kind of sort of push against um, women only spaces, um, and yes, sometimes you can't be led by the nose for funding. Um, and I think that's something which certainly we have resisted. Um, but like you said, that there have been organisations who have fallen prey to that and fallen to the wayside because of it. Mm. You know. Mm. Well, to end on a lighter note, hopefully, um, you'll see beside you there the red book that we record all of our AGMs in. Um, I, I was just wondering if you have mm. any memories or any anecdotes about past AGMs. 
Ooh, you sprung this on me. Um, we had a nice AGM for, I think it was our 25th anniversary, where we had all of the directors back to talk. Um, that was down um, at the edge, I think, the, the water. So we had um, Joanna and Judy and Anna Riley and myself. Um, Judy Seymour, who would be the second director. Um, and actually, that, that was really interesting, wasn't it? Because four directors in 25 years, it's not a big turnover. Um, and uh, But everyone brought something different to it. And, and everyone was there at a different stage in Northern Ireland's evolution as well. Um, so it was fascinating to hear people's different uh, experiences. And it was, it was a lovely event. I still have my key ring from then. Do you have a message for our 40th AGM? I just think, you know, to be so proud of both the longevity of WRDA, how it's continued to evolve as an organisation. And I don't think it has compromised any of its principles. It still empowers women within the community. It still delivers really innovative um, programmes and you know it's still a an organisation that tries to um, particularly convey the experiences of of working class women, women in the community, women struggling on bread lines um, and keeping that in the forefront of policy makers. Um, at a time that, you know, when you really feel like giving up some time, you know, when the political scene is so dismal, where you're wondering, you know, who are you even trying to talk to now? Who is making policy? Um, you know, when you've got anonymous bureaucrats, no politicians able to do anything at the moment. So you kind of hope that there will be, you know, a more positive future where you can go back and and actually start feeling that you can make a difference, that there's an arena to make a difference in. Um, I think, you know, we are in a kind of a position at the moment where we're just drifting and not sure what's going to happen, say, in the autumn. Um, but I suppose you just have to keep a sense of hope. That's what's kept people going here for so long.